How's it going? It's going well. That's great. <laughs> you know what? Thanks for I don't coming in. Say thanks for thanks for having me. You see know, you later. We'll see you another time. <laughs> that's, um, a, that's the best intro ever. Oh, we have good producers here who make me sound in any way smart. <laughs> any way smart. I love this. I got to tape this. Make sure send it to my parents anytime there's any dispute about <laughs> me not doing well. I can be like, listen to what Tom Power said. So I want I want you to take a listen to this for me. Why a bilingual show? Because we're in Montreal, baby. That's why. <laughs> It's the only city in the world where you'll run into a Greek guy in Park X and he'll talk to you in three languages in the same f***ing sentence. So I'm going I'm to try to set up the stakes here. Nothing worse than playing people's comedy on the radio. That's right? fine. I know, sure. <laughs> um, 115,000 people came out to see you in Montreal. Uh, that's only for my farewell show. That's the last show. Yeah. That's the last show. You, yeah. yeah. Um, at one, like, 115,000 people at one time. Yeah. Before we set up the stakes of this, what do you remember from that show? I remember, I'll tell you, my, my biggest memory from that show is almost not getting to the show because traffic was so packed. Everybody was heading to the show downtown because it was an outdoor show in the middle of downtown Montreal. So I almost didn't make it to my own show. I thought to myself, I'm one of those guys I really <laughs> don't spoil myself too much. But I said, listen, it's my big night. It's my farewell show to Quebec. You know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna book a, a an Uber Select. <laughs> I'm gonna book an Uber Select. <laughs> an extra get, five bucks. Yeah. I'll get myself downtown <laughs> in style. So my girlfriend and I started heading to the show. We're already getting tweets and photos of fans who are waiting there. We're seeing the crowds. So uh, at one point, uh, the driver goes, uh, "Sir, we, we we can't go past uh, the bay because uh, the, the Hudson's Bay store." I was like, "What do you mean? He's like, this traffic is too crazy. Everyone's heading to this event." Like he didn't even know who I was, which yeah, is funny. Yeah. So I was like, "Okay, so you're going to be late for the show. You're yeah. going to see. I'm going to be late for the show." I was like, "Well, I guess we'll get out here." So I got off four blocks away from my show, thinking I was going to arrive in this like Uber Select, looking cool. And I didn't even arrive in the Uber Select. I had to call security, come and get me four blocks away. Oh come God. get me at Hudson's Bay. So I remember that. And then I also remember just the excitement. I mean, I'd done the show for four and a half years. Yeah. So, you know, it was a well-oiled machine by then. So I wasn't nervous about the material. But I was just excited about this final show. I just knew that it was going to be special special to me. And, uh, and it was because uh, everybody who'd seen it came out to watch it a second time. And everybody who couldn't see it didn't have the chance or, uh, you know, not necessarily could, have, could could come and see a comedy show. Didn't have the means. Was there, so the whole city came out. It was fun. So, so I'm I'm just trying to understand this because this is something I've been setting up throughout the show. Is that you know I know comics in this country who would be really happy if they could get 400 people in a room every single night for the rest of their lives, right? right? In Canada, right. you know, you get over a hundred thousand people, you know, to come after this show. You're f- selling theaters out. You're selling huge venues out all around the country. Kind of like without no disrespect, but kind of like kind of the highest you can get in Canadian comedy. Right. And you say, all right, I'm done. I'm moving to France. Yeah. Why? Well, because I want to keep that hunger, you know, that hunger of like wanting to to still, you know, you don't want to sit back on your laurels either. And you, and I, at one point I said, I said to myself, I was plateauing as a writer because I wasn't moving. I wasn't doing anything different. I was in the same place for four and a half years, which I loved doing. I loved performing, but I wanted to keep writing. And I think to myself, I know that I'm more of a writer than I am anything else. I love performing, but I like writing is my probably like my, the craft my, of writing. The a craft joke. of writing a joke is yeah. probably the, the, the thing I love the most about this job. So uh, I wanted to go put myself in that situation where I had to earn it again, you know, which is uh, which is I think the best way to write because it's democratic, it's honest, you know, and like honest work in in the arts is probably what you want to do the the most. And and where you like did you did you like were you going in there as a complete unknown? Were you going in there as a club comic to France? Completely unknown. Yeah, like a complete unknown to the audience. The comics knew who I was. Yeah. But I started there in a 12 with 12 people in the audience, an open mic. That was my first gig there. And you went, maybe I should just maybe I should have just stayed in the theaters. <laughs> yeah, my last gig was 115 grand, yeah. 115,000 people, and I left that to to go do 12 seats and I bombed. Yeah. I totally bombed because I was testing for the first time, so I put myself in this danger and and um, culturally, the French are completely different than the Quebecois. So the material wasn't hitting, and there were 12 people, and all of them there were there to watch, you know, people and their family in the audience. They're there to watch Dad, who was doing it for the first time. And right. It was really, like, not even an open mic. It was a laboratory open mic. So they kind of give the, f- the first time you ever want to do comedy, you start these 6 p.m. shows to really just get your stage time. And I wanted to start there just to really 
build myself up. And you did. I mean, we're, we're talking like what two years and change yeah. in 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 France, and you're now you're kind of you're you're kind of doing great. I mean, you're doing really big rooms in France. You're one of the top comics there. Uh, are you surprised by how quickly that happened? Um, I, I guess I'm surprised, but it was a natural progression because I was I've been there two years, two and a half years, but I've been working tirelessly, you know, every day for hours a day, working on the writing, working on the performance, working on uh, building my audience day after day. And I built it bit by bit to get to the point where I am. So yeah, it feels to the outsider, it feels like it was it was uh, very quick. But to me, I, I know the hours that it, that went into it. So it feels like a natural progression. It'll know? be great. You'll be like selling out 100 and, 100 and change, you know, 100 grand in France. You'll be like, I'm going to Antarctica now. <laughs> That's enough. I do want to, I do want to, you know, go to as many places as possible. I think that challenge of, of, uh, of, Adapting and uh, and conquering new places, I think I, it's a need that we, uh, I think, human beings have usually. You know, like you see it throughout history. But for me, I want to do it through comedy, and I want to also um, be able to to earn it every single time, and not have people say, "Well, it, it only worked because his crowd loves him." So no matter what he says on stage, they'll come out. You know, I'd rather people. I'd rather. Say say to myself, you know, every single time I worked yeah. hard and I earned it democratically. I earned it honestly. Yeah. You know? Chris Rock says that. Chris Rock says even if you know, even for him, when he goes into the Comedy Cellar in New York, he says he gets five free minutes. You know, if he does fifteen, he gets five of them for free because he's Chris Rock. Right. Maybe even like three free minutes, and then you got to work for it. You got to make people laugh. Yeah, because they'll let you know quickly. You yeah. know, in comedy, there's no lie. You still bomb every now and then. Have you ever? Of course. Really? Uh, when I'm trying new material, for sure. Wow. You know, there are times I'll write a, a joke and I'll know I've got it. I'll know I've, uh, I've got it, but, you know, I still don't know until I test it in front of an audience. And there's times where I'll feel like, oof, I have the idea, but I'm not sure. And then I'll take it up on stage and the audience will go, that was all right. It wasn't as good as your last five minutes. Right. You need to work on it. They won't say it to you, but you'll feel it. And you're doing this version, like Fr Francis version of America's Got Talent? That's right. I'm one of the judges. I'm the Simon Cowell of France. <laughs> are, you, are you the mean one? I'm the mean one. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah, but I kind of put my own spin on it. So I'm the mean one, but it's kind of like, you know, that guy who's on the show, but he's anti-show. So, you know, he comes on, he makes fun of the other judges, the host, the show itself, the network, the producers. Yeah. So it's kind of like Deadpool. <laughs> you know, like yeah, making fun of the genre. You you're know? breaking the fourth wall of French reality TV. Exactly. Yeah, that's a that's a good shirt. <laughs> Why not? If, you, if you're just tuning in, speaking with Sugar Sammy, Canadian comedian, spent the last couple of years selling out shows in France. Right now, back on this side of the pond for a run of shows in Canada and the U.S. Nice to be back in Canada, though. There's a blizzard in Toronto and in Montreal right now. I know. I know. You know what the thing is? Is I think in Montreal we're probably a little more used to it than uh, Torontonians. Yeah, maybe so. are. Yeah, yeah. 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 but Torontonians are still more used to it than the Americans. I was in Chicago. There was a uh, polar vortex out there a couple of weeks ago. Everything shut down, but like s seriously shut down. Like where nobody was on the streets. I was like, "Oh, you guys are cute." Yeah, I know. I was like, it's it's like a Tuesday in Newfoundland, man. I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Exactly. This, this is this like in June. Yeah, this is. <laughs> we used to call it in Newfoundland. We call it January. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's it's just that. Uh, I want to I want to play. You, you mentioned like. How your show goes over at different places, you know, what, what the audience gives you, what the audience is looking for from you. I just want to play another clip here. So this is part of your act. So you're from Sweden. You're a brown guy, though, no? Yeah? Your family's from Hungary? That doesn't help your brownness. <laughs> is your family from Hungary? No, I'm hungry. I, I just came from India, then I went to Sweden. And then <laughs> they made me assemble furniture there, and then they sent me to them. <laughs> So what's your what's your name? Philip. What is it? Peter. Peter. Oh, that was completely different. <laughs> Peter, but you're brown. You could tell, right? He's what? He's he he's been in Miami. He's tan. <laughs> Did you go with him? You're still white. <laughs> I don't know, lady. I think this guy's been feeding you the wrong story. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if his name is Peter or Pedro. So that's a little bit of my guest, Sugar Sammy, recorded at a show in the U.S. I, I got a crowd work question for you. Crowd work, if you're listening to this, is when you're a comedian, you're looking into the audience, I'm going to tell you this, uh, and, you, and you do sort of improvised bits with the crowd there. Some of the stuff, man, 
some of the stuff people get can get offended by. People get people can walk out. Um, but every time I've seen you do it, they're laughing along, they're joking along, they make it better. Are you scanning the crowd for like, yeah, I, I can go for this person right here because they're going to give me something. They're going to get it. <laughs> well, I think a lot of it is uh, is just uh, listening and watching. So, uh, you know, it's a dance with the audience. And you can feel when someone wants to engage and you can feel when someone doesn't want to. And it's not interesting to anyone to go after the guy who's scared to talk to you. So for me, a lot of times I'll throw out questions in the middle of my show to lead to the next bit. And if someone answers, I'll go with it. Right. You know, and then if they're answering, it's because they want to participate. So I, I'll kind of know, you know. Thing is, good good comedy is always, you know, about listening. About listening and wanting to learn about someone or something. So you have to have that appetite. And for me, I think I have it uh, every single minute I'm on stage and off stage, which is great. I think to, that's what drives me is learning new things every day. And uh, with the audience, uh, just getting to know someone and getting to figure them out and... And, and play with them while I'm up there on stage, I think there's nothing more fun. It's that human connection that, you know, we all look for. But needless to say, I mean, the, the, if, if comedy hasn't changed, at least, like, the conversation around comedy has yeah. changed. I've read more think pieces. I've read more articles. I've read more analysis about um, what comedians should be saying in a club and what a comedian shouldn't be saying in a club. Now, I'm not talking about the extreme examples here. Right. Um, I, I'm not talking about whether people should be able to get up in a club. I mean, it's a very different conversation. But I know comics who are afraid to say certain jokes the club. I know comics who 10 years ago were telling a certain kind of joke and have gotten rid of it and say, you know, I'm fine. I'm glad not telling that joke anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, do you feel, how long have you been doing this now? I've been doing this 22 years. Do you feel like you, you, you what you do has changed? Um, I, I do. I mean, but I think the evolution hasn't happened because of external circumstances. To me, the evolution is a personal one. I think I'm growing as a writer. I've been growing as a writer, you know, uh, every day. And I think it's a good sign as a comic when you look back at your material and you go, ooh, I'm better than that. I think a lot of artists have done that. I'm sure, you know, musicians have done that. Yeah. Where you look back and you go, ooh, I can't believe I put that out. But yeah, but, it's, but sometimes it's like, that joke's not, nah, that joke wasn't funny, I can't believe I put that out. Sometimes it's like, I can't believe I said that. It's kind of an offensive thing to say. Um, it depends. I think, you know, for me, I always say, uh, you, the good thing about comedy is we got to make sure that we're not... Um, you know, sterilizing the art form or any art form. Because, you know, the arts are all about being human, making mistakes, going out there not being perfect. And comedians traditionally are the people uh, in society who talk about a strong point of view and have a strong point of view, whether it's uh, a, 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 one that's accepted by the mainstream or not. And, I mean, what's happening now is people are trying to put comedians in a corporate box. And I think that's... The place where we should be the least is we should be out there in the mar you know in the margins talking about the things that you know people talk about behind closed doors and those points of view. I think you know comedians, that's their role traditionally in society to have those points of view, and we need to encourage that. And I always think that when it's funny, you can get away with anything. It just yeah. it's, it it forces you to become a better writer. That's what it is. So for me, it's like I'm gonna have my point of view. I'm not gonna let you know Twitter or anybody else decide what my point of view is going to be. But I just got to make sure it's that much funnier so I could get away with it. And the tone has to also be a friendly tone. I mean, you could you could tell uh, in someone's tone whether it's mean-spirited and yeah. you know, or whether it's, it's coming from a place of, hey, let's just make fun of this and let's go there. And let's talk about something that's taboo to talk about. Comedians are traditionally the people who say the most horrible things up there on stage. And, you know, we don't want to take that away because then it takes it, – it makes comedy – uh, fall into that, you know, that, you know, it frames it as something that's supposed to be perfect and and corporate. And I think that's probably the least appealing comedy that anybody wants to watch. Yeah, I don't want to go all Scarlet Begonias here, you know, but Judd Apatow says that um, as long as you have, like, love in your heart, mm -hmm. you, you can make a lot of jokes. Of course. I mean, like, one of the, traditionally, one of the people who, who people, uh, you know, comedians... Uh, look up to the most was Don Rickles mm -hmm. and Don Rickles would roast everyone and anyone but you could tell from his tone with the smile on his face that he was doing it it's kind of your best buddy poking fun at you you know yeah and I think if it comes from there it's fine and the audience will let you know pretty quickly so that's the thing the audience always decides for me I never take a joke out saying ah I shouldn't be going there I always take it out only if the audience doesn't laugh but if the audience in general laughs it's a great joke. You got to keep it. I'm very technical like that. Like, I'll yeah. be like, oh, technically this joke works. We're keeping it. You know? yeah. uh, just while I got you, I got about a minute left here with you. But I know you're, you're doing some, sh where are you going? You're going to the U.S. after this? Yeah. 
Do you ever go outside of New York? Do you ever do like the Midwest, do the South? Uh, yeah, I've done Missouri. I've done Missouri before, yeah. Is it is it different now, doing comedy? Listen, I haven't done Missouri in years, right? Uh, you know, But is when, doing comedy in the U.S. different now? It is different because the, the room's divided. The divided? Room, it's very divided because, you know, I come, I have my Canadian point of view, right? So you come from Quebec, by the way. I right? come from Quebec. Yeah, so right. there's so much there, right? There's so many dimensions. I'm a Quebecois Canadian going to the U.S., and pretty much culturally roasting the Americans, you know? It's a cultural roast of the Americans. So it's very particular, and I think uh, most people, you know, uh, tend to appreciate it, but there are definitely some in the room, uh, you know, and a lot of them are, are heavy Trump supporters. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely, uh, you could see, you could see that, the, you know, it doesn't please them to see this Indian Canadian come in here and tell them uh, what's wrong with them. So what do you do? Oh, I talk about everything. I talk about the differences between Canada and the States. I'll talk mm -hmm. about what's going on politically. I'll talk about the divisions that are up there, but also compare the States to France. I'll talk about, you know, their cultural habits, their eating habits, uh, <laughs> their political mm -hmm. points of view, how they're viewed by the rest of the world. Right. So, uh, so I think a lot of people do appreciate it, but I think uh, it's going to be the way uh, demographically they're divided in terms of uh, who shows up at the... At the uh, at the voting uh, at the voting polls, you know. Nice to see you. Hey, nice to see you. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. This was fun. This was fun. <laughs> um, I know you've done like seventeen <laughs> interviews this morning. Yeah, but it's great. This is fine. This is our first one together. Oh, one of many, I hope.